about uh, the design of welding alloys, the actual weld metal that you use to fill, fill the gap. And there's a very large number of variables involved. We've got the chemical composition. There are many elements here, and there can be more. And some of the elements can be in concentrations as low as 20 parts per million, but they nevertheless uh, have an effect on the properties. And some of them are present as impurities, which have a significant effect on the development of microstructure. Um, of course, there's a range of welding parameters and heat treatments involved as well. So the problem is very complicated. How do we design a welding alloy which will give us the required properties? And this is a, a very simple weld method, com well, compared with the sort of things that uh, you know, Wartek and John are doing, which have about 30 different passes and really deep wells and so forth. Here we have just uh, three layers deposited on top of each other. And the color etching reveals that all of them have a different microstructure. And indeed, we've got a change in the heat affected zone. And the parent plate far away from the well also has contrast indicating chemical segregation in the plate. Okay. I'm going to focus on just this region, which is the structure uh, immediately after depositing a weld, but not affected by heat treatment due to subsequent passes. And even in that, you can see chemical segregation. Okay. That's one thing. The second thing is that there appears to be a columnar grain structure. So this is not like the grain structure of the parent plate. We have long grains, which we have to represent somehow in the calculations. Okay, so a very simplified view of the microstructure of that region is as follows. We have these long grains of austenite, okay, columnar grains of austenite, and those grains have evolved by transformation from long grains of delta ferrite in general. As the material cools, we saw in this morning that the phase that forms first is a lot of ferrite, which decorate the austenite grain boundaries. As cooling continues, you get weedman certain ferrite because no longer is diffusional transformation possible. So you get these plates of weedman certain ferrite. And during further cooling, we get this microstructure, which uh, is mostly unique to weld deposits, intragranulated nucleated bainite. And in welding terminology, that's called acicular ferrite, simply because uh, you know these, these things appear like needles, although they are plates in three dimensions. And the reason why this is mostly limited to well deposits is that they nucleate intragranularly on oxide particles which are present in the well. So those are heterogeneous nucleation sites, and those oxides can be very complicated mixtures of many different kinds of compounds. But that is the sort of desired microstructure. And the reason is that, again, the plates point in many different directions as opposed to form in these packets. Okay. So a crack propagating across there is frequently deflected, whereas here it can basically grow across a set of packets or across one of these coarser grains. So a secular ferrite is the desired microstructure <coughs> in wells. And just to show you what it really looks like, um, that is a weld metal microstructure. You can see these uh, layers of allotriomorphic ferrite. You can see these plates of Greenbinstein ferrite coming off from those layers. And here you have the very fine intragranularly nucleated acicular ferrite plates. Okay. So in this case, the dirt, the oxygen, the oxides are actually helping to develop a good microstructure from the point of view of toughness. And this is what we are going to try and predict. <coughs> so to go about prediction, uh, first of all, of course, we need to define a chemical composition. And I can't tell you how to go from a welding electrode to a specific chemical composition. I'm starting from a particular chemical composition of the weld. Okay. So there's magic involved in going from the electrode to get the right sort of composition. Wotek would be able to tell you more about that. Okay, there's all kinds of fluxes and things react to produce the right composition. So all these calculations are starting from a known well metal composition. And then somebody will have to design the electrode to produce that composition. Of course, this is not an isothermal transformation process, so we need 
a cooling curve. And that will depend on the welding process that you have. And we have some very simple models to be able to estimate the cooling curves in the right region where transformations happen. Uh, we need to know the size of the austenite grains because that determines the evolution of microstructure. And if there is chemical segregation, which inevitably there is, then we do the calculations allowing for chemical segregation. So effectively, we do separate calculations for solid depleted, solid enriched regions, and then combine them together. From the chemical composition, you calculate a phase diagram. And it doesn't matter how many elements we have, it's possible to do that. You calculate uh, time temperature transformation diagrams. I'll show you all this. And you start to treat the first phase that forms, which is allotriomorphic ferrite, exactly as we discussed this morning. Now, if you look at the shape of the columnar austenite grains that you have, they are in three dimensions like hexagonal prisms. Okay, so they are very long along the C-axis, approximately five millimeters typically, and something like a hundred micrometers wide. This is what the shape of a normal grain looks like in an in a ordinary steel. It, it's isotropic almost. Okay? So we call it an equiax grain structure. Now, in this case, we can define the size simply by measuring the mean linear intercept. That's a fundamental parameter. Uh, which completely describes that grain structure because the amount of surface we have per unit volume is equal to 2 over the mean linear intercept. Okay. And what we need in calculations is the amount of surface per unit volume. In this case, because it's anisotropic, uh, a mean linear intercept is not sufficient to describe the shape because, look, we have two parameters here, A and C. So to, to derive A and C, we also need to measure the mean aerial intercept. That means if I cut this plane, red, uh, this grain randomly, it will present a certain area. Okay. Now, that becomes really complicated. It has been done in order to understand the geometry, but you don't want to do that routinely. Uh, however, the length is much bigger than the width. So this reduces, actually, approximately, to a function of just the width. Okay. So we need not actually make very complicated measurements routinely to define the austenite grain size or to calculate it. We just try and predict the width of those grains. And there will be an end effect which will add an error, but it will be a minor error. Right, so the first phase to form then is these layers of ferrite. I showed you exactly this slide this morning. <coughs> But the thing that I want you to notice now is that look, this is a fairly uniform layer that is formed at the austenite grain boundaries. That means that nucleation is not a problem. I mean, it must have happened at the same rate all along the boundary. So we are going to ignore nucleation theory completely and treat this simply as a growth problem. And indeed, it is a one-dimensional growth problem because the layers are just thickening. So these are all the simplifications that you make. Uh, and then you use your uh, diffusion control growth theory that we did this morning to predict these curves, where the thickness varies with time to the power of a half. Now, I pointed out to you this morning that uh, this calculation is very sensitive to the carbon concentration when we go to low carbon concentration. And that's because we are approaching the solubility limit of carbon in ferrite. So as soon as all the carbon can dissolve in the ferrite, there's no need for diffusion, so the rate would be infinite, growth rate. Of course, it won't be infinite because other processes become rate controlling, but we are getting to a point where the calculations become very sensitive to carbon. And I want you to bear that in mind because later on, uh, I'll show you how industry deals with this problem. So the growth rate then uh, relies on this parabolic thickening rate constant, alpha 1, which this morning I gave you an approximate analysis. Uh, you remember we had the concentration terms, the average, uh, average carbon concentration in your material, solubility in austenite, solubility in ferrite, 
And this equation looks um, a little bit more complicated simply because I didn't assume that the concentration gradient is constant. It actually varies like an error function. But it doesn't change the essence of anything. We still have thickness varying with time to the half. And we have a concentration dependent diffusion <coughs> coefficient now. But again, the essence of the problem doesn't change. So, supposing that our assumption that nucleation can be ignored is correct, then we ought to have a correlation between the volume fraction of ferrite and the parabolic rate constant. Each point here represents a different welding error, and you can see there is a good correlation between the parabolic thickening rate constant and volume fraction, justifying that let's forget about nucleation theory and just treat this as a growth problem. And this, uh, this term here, which appears in all the kinetic equations, so here, for example, and when I talk about weedman sand ferrite, it'll be there again, and so on. It is kind of a dimensionless supersaturation. The larger the value of omega, closer it is to 1, the faster will be the kinetics. And you can see that it can approach 1 when the average carbon concentration is the same as the solubility in ferrite. And that's why things are very sensitive to... Uh, low carbon concentrations. Basically, this point here becomes the same as this point here, so there's no need to partition any carbon. And this is what industry does to cope with it. Um, there are things called carbon equivalents. And you know that if you exceed that carbon equivalent, then your plate will crack when you weld it. Okay, That's the meaning of a carbon equivalent. Um, if your steel has a composition, uh, say we are dealing with this equation, still has a composition which exceeds a, value, a, a critical value of carbon equivalent, then when you weld it, it will crack. Okay. But they found out very quickly, when the modern steels came out, that really this carbon equivalent, which was designed for high carbon concentrations, doesn't work for low carbon concentrations. So they developed a different carbon equivalent equation for modern steels. And the thing I'd like you to note is that, look, here we are dividing manganese by 6, okay? whereas here manganese has a much lower, smaller effect. And the reason is that carbon is really controlling things when we go to low carbon concentrations. Alloying elements have a smaller effect at low carbon concentrations. So industry re has realized this, and it's completely consistent with the kinetic theory. Okay, so... The equations we had for, for the parabolic thickening were isothermal. And this is not happening isothermally. Uh, you know, if we have a manual metal arc well, then we'll have a current voltage, a speed, uh, interpass, or preheat temperature, which will determine this cooling curve. And there are very sophisticated ways of calculating cooling, cooling curves. And there are very simple ways as well which if you fit a couple of constants, will cover a wide range of parameters. Okay? So all you need in order to... The only input from the welding process, if you like, into this modeling, is the cooling curve. So if you use a laser method, you simply have to modify that curve to take account of the cooling conditions. And then you integrate the growth kinetics over a temperature range instead of doing it at a constant temperature where this is the point where the transformation initiates and finishes. And where do we get this information from? You know, where the transformation begins and finishes? Well, we have to be able to calculate a time temperature transformation diagram. So here are some uh, example calculations. A time temperature transformation diagram basically means that if I start from austenite and I cool it rapidly to this point, how long does it take for transformation to begin? If I cool it to this point, how long does it take for transformation to begin? And we can routinely do these calculations as a function of many, many different alloying elements, taking account of nucleation and growth. And these are examples. So this is an iron carbon alloy. If I add manganese, then I retard transformations greatly, and so on. So that's possible to do. So on our flowchart, we are around here. Uh, we've got the thickness of the layer of ferrite, and we've got the austenite grain parameters. 
So I can convert that into a boiling fraction very easily because all the osmite grains are decorated with this layer of ferrite. As the temperature drops, we begin to form Wiedenstaden ferrite, which are these plates of ferrite which grow by this paramilitary mechanism where the substitution of lattice is deformed, but carbon diffuses during the course of transformation. So let's once again make the approximation that we do not require to consider nucleation. Okay? Let's just treat this as a growth problem. Of course, the shape here is different. It's not, no longer one-dimensional thickening. You've got a plate growing, so you've got a complicated diffusion field. But the theory for this exists, and we simply need to apply it. And here are the growth rate calculations. Um, one thing to notice is that I explained that the osmite grain size is of the order of 100 micrometers wide, typically. So, the growth rate is hundreds of micrometers per second, and therefore this transformation is finished in about a quarter of a second. Yeah. So you can treat it more or less isothermally. Uh, again, notice that the growth kinetics are sensitive to carbon concentration at low carbon concentration, okay? justifying those two different carbon equations. So let's see how the volume fraction of Wiedmannstein ferrite varies with the calculated growth rate. You can see that that's fairly random. Okay? There's no correlation between the volume fraction of Wiedmannstein ferrite and the calculated growth rate. And there's nothing wrong with the growth rate calculations. You can do measurements and show that the theory works extremely well. So there's something else going on which is giving us bad results. And that's something else, is that by the time this transformation starts, we are getting interference between transformations happening from different locations. Okay. So let me illustrate that. <clears throat> this is a cross-section of that columnar grain. Okay. So it's a hexagon. And I'm going to compare a steel in which transformation is rapid and a steel in which transformation is slow. So here we have a layer of electromorphic ferrite forming at the boundaries, and of course here there will be a thinner layer of electromorphic ferrite. So temperature drops, I get rapid Wiedmannstein ferrite growth here, I get relatively slow Wiedmannstein ferrite growth. In this case it's so fast that it spreads across the grain before there is an opportunity for much of the acicular ferrite to form. Whereas in this case, because the growth rate here is slow, the acicular ferrite can dominate the microstructure. Okay. So we need to take account of impingement between particles growing from different regions. So when we calculate the volume fraction of Wiedmannstein ferrite, it's not just a function of the growth rate, but also of the austenite grain shape and size, and the time taken to get impingement between intragranularly nucleated plates and those forming from the grain boundary. So I'll show you later on that when we take this into account, we get good agreement between the volume fractions. Uh, this is a transmission electron micrograph of uh, acicular ferrite. And you can see that the plates originate from these non-metallic inclusions. Okay? That's just to show you that it nucleates on particles. Happens to be a very lucky micrograph because the chance of finding the inclusion in the plate is actually quite small. Okay? It's of the order of 7% of the time you should see an inclusion inside the plate. <clears throat> now, some time ago, when we developed this model, we didn't understand how a circular ferrite forms. So we used to simply calculate it as the difference, you know, the amount of austenite that is left untransformed after electromorphic ferrite and Wiedenstein ferrite are formed. But we now have a theory for this, so we can calculate it rigorously, because it's simply the theory for Baynard with intra granular nucleation. So then you have your computer, and you can do calculations like this, where you plot volume fraction versus carbon. This is a, a simple alloy, because I can't illustrate many different alloying element effects, but you can vary more or less any of those elements uh, that you like. Calculate the well metal microstructure. These are typical results. There are many, many such results now in the literature. 
where you are plotting the calculated fraction versus the measured fraction for a whole series of welding alloys. And then we need to do something about properties. Okay. And one of the properties uh, of importance is yield strength. And yield strength is fairly easy to model from a fundamental point of view because we know how the strength of pure iron without any microstructure behaves as a function of temperature and strain rate. So these experiments have been done, um, and even if there is no microstructure, dislocations have a barrier to motion inside the crystal lattice, because the crystal lattice has a periodic barrier to the dislocation movement, so we've got that. <coughs> we know how elements, solid solutions strengthen as a function of temperature, so that's how they do it. At low temperatures, they actually help the dislocation to move by introducing a perturbation which allows them to move over a barrier. So you get solid solutions softening at low temperatures. And carbon has a different kind of a solid solution strengthening effect because <coughs> of the holes in the lattice. So all this knowledge is available. You then have the grain size strengthening and you might have defects in your microstructure which give you strength as well. All of these things can be calculated for a single phase you then need to combine the different phases together. And the simplest thing is to use a rule of mixtures. Okay. Uh, so that means that supposing I'm, I've got a mixture of martensite and bainite, then I simply assume a linear variation of strength according to volume fraction. But things are more complicated. See, when allotiomorphic ferrite forms, it actually partitions carbon into the austenite. Therefore, any martensite that forms will be richer in carbon and therefore harder. So if you take account of that partitioning, you get better agreement with the data. But there are other effects, constraint. Yeah? So if you have a hard phase and a soft phase adjacent to each other, then the hard phase will restrict the deformation of the soft phase. And the hard phase itself will yield at a lower stress. So when you take constraint into, a part, into account, you get much better agreement between the calculated strength and the measured strength. And these are, these are comparisons of the calculated yield strength versus the experimental yield strength. But this is where you get stuck now. Okay? So we've got the yield strength. But we need many other properties. That we need to know about the choppy toughness, we need, need to know about fatigue properties, creep resistance and so forth. All these complicated properties. And that's where the neural networks come in because there are huge amounts of data in the literature. You know, thousands of experiments have been done. You consolidate those data and try and recognize quantitatively the patterns in those data. And now there exist models for all of these properties. <coughs> so that essentially is how phase transformation theory is used in the calculation of well metal microstructure. And I'll now show you a calculation. Okay. So look, we have a, a choice of processes here. What F? What would you like to do? Flux going out of order. Right. Which is number? CO2. Two. Two. Right, so we will calculate an austenite grain size instead of putting in an experimental number. Right, so I'm going to ask you a whole series of questions about the chemical composition now. So carbon. Make up your mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, silicon. Uh, 0.45. Manganese. Uh, 1.4. Silicon point. was 0.45. Right? 0.45. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'll change it. Yeah. We'll, we'll get an opportunity to change that. Sorry. Uh, nickel. No nickel. Molybdenum. No molybdenum. Uh, chromium. No chromium. Vanadium. Vanadium. Two. 
Okay, current voltage speed. Current. These last four parameters affect the cooling curve. Okay. Right, and nitrogen? Nitrogen, 70 or seven. Okay. Uh, boron? Boron, point double or seven. And oxygen? Aluminium? He's an expert, yes. Point, let's say point double L three. Titanium? Uh, let's say five fifty. Uh, point oh five, yeah. Point oh five five. Point oh uh, five five. And sulfur? Sulfur. Okay, so I need to change the silicon concentration because I put it as 0.05 instead of 0.5, right? 0.45. 0.45, sorry. Okay. Okay. Now, what will happen is a phase diagram calculation, TTT curve calculations, and so on, but all those numbers will just whiz past, okay? So we won't be able to see them unless I scroll back. Right. So this is just a summary of the data. And here is a calculation of the microstructure. So we have 40% of electromorphic ferrite. About 20% of Wittgenstein ferrite, about 40% of acicular ferrite. Okay. Uh, various other parameters defining the microstructure, like the austenite grain size and so forth. And if it is a multipass run, then about 20% of this will be like the as deposited microstructure, and the rest like the reheated microstructure, and various other microstructural parameters. And does this make sense, Vortec? So we have the average yield strength is about 440 megapascals. Yeah. Average yield strength is yeah. 440 megapascals. We are too long. It should be 450 at least. <laughs> 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 441, and it should be 453. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be minimum. OK. And the tensile strength is about 516 megapascals. 516. Yeah. Uh, and um, you can also see the contributions to strength from the different components. So here, for example, is the contribution from the pure ion without any microstructure, about 220 megapascals of that, and acicular ferrite, and so forth and so on. And if we had. Uh, if you want to examine the... It will change the medium, for example. Yeah. So I was just going to say, if we want to examine the effect of uh, trace elements, mm -hmm. yeah? for, for example, you know, um, trace element reactions, because those are important, mm -hmm. then we can do that as well. Five. So look, uh, according to the inputs we had, the total aluminium is 30 parts per million, of which about 15 should be dissolved. And total titanium is 550, total ni nitrogen is 70 parts per million, uh, boron is nothing, and oxygen is 500. This becomes interesting here also if you add boron, because boron interacts with nitrogen. You, you have been asking me about boron. 
that was bothering us some, some years ago was we can see a circular ferret in a transmission electron microscope with no carbides inside it. But nobody has ever reported a circular ferret with carbides in it. So we did uh, calculations to, we developed a model for the transition from upper to lower vena. And I explained in a couple of lectures ago that if you have a carbon concentration which is below a certain value, 0.4, you never get lower vena. So we thought that all well deposits have a low carbon concentration. So we made a well deposit with 0.6 weight percent carbon. All right? And of course, it cracked spontaneously, but we found lower acicular ferrite. Right? And we have written a paper called Lower Acicular Ferrite. Right. Okay. It's of no consequence because it's hopeless in mechanical properties. Yeah. So therefore, the acicular ferrite that you see consists of these small 10-micron roll platelets, platelets, like what you showed with that Yes. Now, if you have a lot of nucleation sites, Oops. then they are basically individual platelets because oh, well, they hit each yeah. other before something can happen. Mm -hmm. So you mean the, the volume fraction of the inclusions influences the, the, the size of the sequence? Yes. Well. yes. Unfortunately, inclusion is also a nuclear fracture, so you have to sort of, yeah. So some of these um, elements would influence the size of the delta ferrite, yeah. and of, of course, your, then your grain size. Is that the, yeah, the, no, you're so absolutely the program right. that you're showing the different elements, maybe. That's right. So, so say if you increase the carbon, then the size goes down, and so on. Mm -hmm. So again, there isn't sufficient theory to deal with that. So we are using an empirical equation, yeah. which is fitted on Evans's data, actually, to work out the austenite grain width mm -hmm. as a function of composition. Yeah. 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 OK, yes. thank you very much. Thank, thank yeah. you, Harry, just on behalf of the very long, we're very grateful for these uh, lectures, and yeah, delighted you to come and 
uh, work with us and uh, some, had some very interesting talks. So, as a token of our appreciation, we've got a gift from everyone here at Woodview. Oh, thank you and, very much. Uh, yeah, well, you're welcome to open it now if you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my, it's my uh, pleasure to be here. Okay, so. It's being taken. Oh, wow. It's very, very small, so be, yeah. be careful. Oh, beautiful! Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, just for people that can't see, it's a it's a solid, a solid crystal opal mm -hmm. uh, from Cooper Pit. It's uh, what South Australia produces about eighty percent of the world's opals, so it's something unique to South Australia. And uh, um, yeah, with your interest in crystallography, and that's right. So <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and it's not too heavy to carry back on the plane. So <laughs> <laughs> it's very thoughtful. Thank you, Hello. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.